Okay, happy Sabbath, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, let's go ahead and get right into the lesson. Uh, let me start with the word of prayer for us. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful today to be gathered today on your Sabbath day, our Sabbath day, Father, in uh, coming together for this lesson study in the arts and sciences. Father, I just pray this morning that your words would be spoken through me and that uh, your Holy Spirit would be amongst us to guide us into all truth and understanding of what we're about to embark on. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so uh, education in arts and sciences. Um, you know, we had a lesson before that was uh, worldview versus biblical view. And I think it's kind of similar, but in this case, it's education in the arts and sciences. And we're going to see uh, what uh, some of the things are that we're looking at as far as the differences go with what people believe as far as what we're taught uh, primarily in, in education in schools uh, versus uh, the things that were taught in, uh, in uh, the Word of God and how these things relate. And uh, anyway, uh, let me just start with the memory text we find in uh, Psalms 19, verse 1. And it reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, Let's just move forward. So, uh, <clears throat> Sabbath schools, or excuse me, Sabbath uh, afternoon's lesson study. Uh, I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to go through it and uh, pull some things from it. Um, so, uh, the beginning line says, education includes what has been called the arts and sciences. So, again, what we're taught in schools. Um, but when we learn or teach the arts and sciences from a biblical perspective, what does this imply? Um, so once again, as I mentioned, we're gonna just basically be looking at the two of the differences. And what we're gonna try and get a better understanding is of, once again, one of the biggest questions, I think, is what is truth? Um, and, and, and the argument can really go both ways when we ask that question, you know, uh, if you asked a person that was an atheist or a non-believer or of a different faith, uh, they would, might most likely have complete different answers to that question than what a Adventist or a Christian might view as what is truth and understanding as far as what we know through what we're taught. So. I'm just going to read the bottom line on Sabbath afternoon lesson study. Uh, and it, uh, or, or the last paragraph, it says, For such an education truly to function, we need God's word to inform the teaching of every discipline from humanities to, mole to molecular biology. Without it, we can lose sight of God's enormity, his sovereignty as creator and sustainer of our world in learning to see how God views his creation, or excuse me, God views his creation as organic and purpose-filled, we come closer to understanding how certain discipline, disciplines could and should be taught. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm just going to jump to Sundays. Any comments so far? Okay. So Sunday, the heading is the Lord alone. Um, so Basically, uh, the beginning is just giving us an example of the gestation period of a child when it's uh, in the mother's womb and that time period. Um, I like what it says at the bottom. It says, as the fetus enlarges, so does the mother's abdomen right out in front of her person. The expectant mother is made always aware of her child, just as our Heavenly Father is always aware of His children. I like that, you know, so she's got the baby just right there in view, I mean, not in view, but the evidence of the baby in view, continually before that baby is born. Um, okay, Romans 1, 18 through 21, Psalms 19, 1 through 6, and Nehemiah 9, 6. Um, if anybody would like to pull one of those up and maybe read one of those, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Go ahead, brother. Yes, that'll work. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, brother. Um, yeah, that, that's always been one of my favorite scriptures because what it's basically saying is that, you know, I read before that on Judgment Day, nobody will have an excuse and they will acknowledge God as the creator because there is no excuse. God says that I've shown them who I am in everything that I've created. Everything, you know, from animals, plants, us. Uh, you can see God's handiwork in it all. And I, and I believe, because the Bible also says that people believe, but they just deny it. They just deny the truth for reasons which are probably because also what I've read before is that, uh, like atheism, the reason atheism was invented, because if you don't believe in a God, then you don't have to account for sin. So basically, I can do whatever I want, and I don't have to account for it. So uh, that's pretty much what, what this verse is saying. And, and I'll read 21 once again. It says, because although they knew God, everybody, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to take... Uh, Nehemiah 9, 6, uh, Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalms 19, 1 through 6 uh, is a little bit longer. I'm just going to read one of them out of there, though. Verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So that's the uh, memory verse, of course. That's where we get it from. Uh, but Nehemiah 6 is, is similar. It says, You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, the host of heaven worships you. So not only did he make it all, but it also says that he preserves it or sustains everything. You know, and it gives some examples of some of the things he made. Everything in heaven above and everything in the earth beneath. So basically, God made everything, right? The universe and all, that, all that's in it and all that's on the earth and all that's in heaven. Okay, so it's telling us that Again, the heading is the Lord alone. God alone is the creator and sustainer of everything. There is no other. There is nothing else that sustains it. Uh, although science tries to come up with other explanations of things, and we're going to talk about that in just a bit. Um, okay, so I'm going to just pull just briefly, and then uh, if there's any comments on what we're discussing here, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and uh, talk loud when we do. <laughs> Okay, uh, it says that uh, Paul in Romans 1, 18 through 21 says that those who reject this God will be without excuse on judgment day because enough about him can be learned from what he has made. In other words, they won't be able to plead ignorance. I already mentioned that, but I just wanted to read it from the lesson study. Um, also, it says worldly education all but works on the assumption of no God. Christian education must not fall into that trap, nor must it work even more subtly from the principles based on the assumption that there is no God. Either way, humans are bound to wind up in error. So yeah, as Christians, you know, uh, we, I think we, most of us have gone to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm just gonna say regular schools, unlike uh, Christian schools perhaps, or private schools. Most of us have got a formal education, and what that usually entails would be things like the teaching of evolution, right? And other things that are not biblical. So we got to be really careful when we do study things. I mean, even colleges will teach these things that are non-biblical. So as Christians, we got to be really, really careful of what we read and study when it comes to things outside of the Word of God. And besides that, I've said it before, you know, uh, people will go outside of God to find answers to things when, in fact, the Bible has really all of the answers to everything that we need to learn or know on how to live this life. Everything. Take any topic, you'll find it in the Bible because God doesn't leave us without a blueprint on how to live this life the way he intends us to live this life. Okay. Um, any comments? Okay, go ahead, brother.
That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, from ancient philosophers and their teachings, you know, I mean, this goes way back, of course, probably to the beginning of time. Um, okay, yeah, thank you for your comment, Chuck. Uh, I'm going to read the bottom here just briefly. It says, think about the incredible wonder and beauty in our world even after sin. How can we learn to draw hope and comfort from it, especially in times of personal trials and suffering? So, yeah, I mean... Uh, you think about the world today, um, there's still a lot of beauty in the world. There's still a lot of good things in the world. It's still incredible to look at the things that God has created, even despite what sin has done. Um, okay, Monday's lesson, the beauty of holiness. Uh, we had this before in a prior study also, uh, Psalms 96, 9, and it reads, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Um, yeah, last time it was talking about, I'm just going to bring that back up to throw this in, uh, but we're going a different route here today. But uh, it had mentioned uh, the beauty of, of holiness, uh, you know, seeing how ugly the world is today, how ugly things that people would do in past times, in present times, without God. Um, you know, like back in the day during Bible times, you know, they would actually sacrifice their children and burn their children as sacrifices. Uh, imagine what kind of people those were, you know, that could actually do something so horrific, right? Um, okay, so the beauty of, of holiness, so the beauty of God outside of sin and holiness. Um, how do we understand this concept, the beauty of holiness? What should this mean to a Christian, and how should it impact what we teach about art and the beauty often associated with it? Uh, do I have any takers that want to give a comment on what what you think the, the beauty of holiness means? I mean, I know it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a big question, but... <laughs> okay. The beauty of holiness. Yeah, it says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Okay, well, let's see what the lesson tells us. Oh, go ahead, brother. <laughs> I, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> What's he talking about? <laughs> it, it surprised me. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what was his name again? Michael Michael Wilcox. Okay. Okay, so uh, give me a kind of a, a, a time period because I'm just kind of curious. Oh, he throw up this in the 1980s. Oh, okay. So modern, modern commentator, modern day commentator. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you, brother, for sharing that. I appreciate it. 
Um, okay, so. Uh, did I read this already? How do we understand this concept? The beauty of holiness, what should this mean to a Christian, and how should it impact what we teach about art and the beauty, yeah, often associated with it. So I'm just going to read from the lesson study just briefly here, so we can get hopefully to Friday. Uh, it says, though it has been said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And you know, when I, when I thought about that, uh, it is true, because when we think about the beautiful things that God has created, and as I mentioned, even though we are in a sin-filled world today, there is still a lot of God's beauty to be seen in so many things, right? Um, but the, everything that God made, was everything that God made beautiful? Um, that's kind of a, a difficult question. I mean, really, if you think about it, some people would say a snake, for example, is, is an ugly creature, right? But others might say, wow, this is a beautiful creature. Look at the patterns. Look at the design, the color. Look at the detail in his eye or whatever it might be. You can find beauty in it, right? Um, so really, the beauty in the eye of the beholder, it really truly is. Uh, because it can go either way, depending on who's looking at it and, and, and who's giving the comments on what it is, whether it's beautiful or not. Um, so, if our fallen world still looks so beautiful, who can imagine what it must have looked like before the fall? I like that, you know? I mean, if we think this is beautiful, what did the world prior to the fall look like? Um, and this teaches us that God indeed is the creator of the beautiful. Yes, because he created everything. Um, I'm going to just read the bottom, Ellen G. White's comment. God would have his children appreciate his works and delight in the simple, quiet beauty with which he has adorned our earthly home. He is a lover of the beautiful, and above all, that is outwardly attractive. He loves beauty of character. He would have us cultivate purity and simplicity, the quiet graces of the flowers. Um, yeah, so from a Christian standpoint, uh, I believe this is true for almost all Christians, that we really can see God in so many things. I mean, I know that when I look at a baby, I see God. When I see an animal or creature, I see God as a creator. Don't get me wrong, not to be confused with God is in everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm, I said, <laughs> being really careful here. Um, yeah, so we do see God in everything. We can see his creation. We can see his handiwork in everything. And uh, we can see the beauty of it, like, even in the tiniest flower. And I know that's not that, what that's saying there. Um, Genesis 3, 6, would somebody take that for me? Uh, if, if not, I can take it. But also Proverbs 6, 25, 31. Through 30? No. How about uh, just uh, Genesis 3, 6? If I have any takers. Okay. Thank you, sister. Um, so oh, we see something that was very beautiful but were the results, just because it was beautiful of it, something good? Just because something is beautiful doesn't always mean that it's good, right? Um, I like uh, Proverbs uh, 6.25. <laughs> it says, Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. Um, I mean, if we take a woman and the beauty, the beauty of a beautiful woman, you know, we might say, well, that's a good thing, you know, but we know that just because it's beauty does not mean that it will always produce good results either, right? Um, so this is what we're, we're, what we're looking at here is, is things that are beautiful that God has created. Are they always good? Um, at times, they, they can turn out to be something negative or, or not good. Uh, Proverbs 31.30 also says, uh, Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Okay. Um, 
What does it teach us about beauty alone isn't necessarily good or holy? Let me just, as usual, read the bottom here. It says, as with everything God has done, we have an enemy who distorts and exploits it. It, should be, it shouldn't be surprising then that beauty and concepts of beauty can be used against us as well. Thus, especially in the arts, Christian education, by, guided by Scripture, must help us learn to be careful in understanding that not all that is beautiful is necessarily good or holy. So, truth, right? Um, okay, any comments? All right, let's go to Tuesday. It's going to give us a little bit more on this topic. Uh, we were talking about earlier uh, with a beautiful mm hmm Yeah, go ahead, brother. One of the things that, that I've always loved about the United States is her the simplicity and modesty. Right? Uh-huh. Yes. Very modest. Um, it's, I was learning something, and, and it falls to us who hire ugly as teachers. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Okay, I haven't heard that one. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, so really, it, it really boils down to, because we, we, we've been looking at the beauty part, but the holiness part is what we really should be looking at. So if something is beautiful, as you mentioned, the holiness part of a, of a beauty, the holiness part would be refraining and doing what, directing us the way God tells us that we're to look upon somebody, you know, not just from the outward, but as you mentioned, Dina, the beautiful things that she has are, are, are coming from within, right? Um, also, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but also, uh, if you think about it, uh, is, you know, somebody had said, I think it was one of you two that had said uh, that God does like beauty, obviously. And when you read the Bible, you read oftentimes where God will comment on somebody's beauty or handsomeness, oftentimes. Uh, and then if you look in Revelation, there's two beautiful women in Revelation, but not both of them are holy, right? Go ahead, brother.
but Yeah, I think, I think you summed it up for us there, Chuck. Thanks. Beauty of holiness is not really the external thing. It's, it's an internal thing. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so here's a question at the bottom. What are some beautiful things that are not necessarily holy and good? Or what are beautiful things that can be made unholy and bad depending upon circumstances? What standards should we use to make these distinctions. Of course, the Word of God is the standard, right? Um, okay, any other comments? Yeah, go ahead, sister. Ah, I was gonna bring that up. You, thank you, I'm glad you brought it up. Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, because of his beauty, the iniquity is found. Yeah, that's right, that's right. It was certainly, uh, and, that, and that's powerful because if you think about it, it was the beauty thing, we could say, I guess, that caused all of this, this sin thing that we know, right? Yeah. Good, thank you, sister. Uh, any other comments? Okay. Uh, okay, let's move on to Tuesdays. Experts in error, I like this one. Experts in error. Um, so, we know in this world we've got a lot of philosophies uh, that does not honor God, right? We've got a lot of ideas. People have plenty of ideas about what they believe uh, that are without God. Um, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Christians must carefully consider their own business in serving certain industries patronizing certain establishments, consuming certain media. Yeah, I think that that's, sums it up right there. Um, okay, 1 Timothy, verse, or 1 Timothy 6 is what we're looking at. If you want to just turn there and uh, see what we can just maybe glean from, from 1 Timothy 6, because there is a lot in there that we should uh, take notice of. Um, so... We're looking at 9 and 10 particularly to start out with. Let me just read that just real briefly here. 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. 9 reads, those who desire, uh, it says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the faith, or excuse me, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Um, you know, it says that they, they strayed from the faith because of money. You know, doesn't uh, uh, Matthew, Jesus tell us the same thing? I, I think, it, what is it, Matthew 7, where he says, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that one, uh, you know, or, or excuse me, it's actually uh, the parable of the sower and, of, and the seed, Matthew thir somewhere in Matthew 13, right? And, and one of those issues that people have is, it says uh, that they, their, their worries or, or tr uh, troubles and cares of this world, right? And they don't bear any fruit. 
Um, so that's really similar with that, actually. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Uh, yes, comment. Go ahead. It's the, it's the love of money. That's right. No. Yes. Yes. But interesting enough, what we're going to look at warns us about those issues about money and falling into that trap. Uh, and we're going to just see real, real quick here. Just give us a moment. Uh, it says, uh, the rest of... 1 Timothy 6, what are the key pursuits that Paul endorses? So what are the key pursuits that he endorses? Um, let me just pull it, pull it up. Give me one second. Proverbs 6, right? Or excuse me, Proverbs 1. <clears throat> okay. Um, so first of all, uh, it's Solomon who is giving this counsel, right, with Proverbs? So... He first goes on when he, when he says in verse 3, he says uh, about uh, the Proverbs, he, he says it's good advice and understanding them with deep meaning. He says they can teach you how to live intelligently, how to be honest, just, and fair. They can make an inexperienced person clever and teach young people how to be resourceful. These Proverbs can even add to the knowledge of the wise and give guidance to the educated so that they can understand the hidden meanings of the Proverbs and the problems that the wise raise. So in other words, the, the Proverbs are claiming that they can give you a lot of wisdom and understanding, and, and not just for ourselves, but to be able to um, come in defense of God when it comes to these things that are outside of God that people, intelligent people, educated people, might want to argue with you, right? I mean, that's what it said. Um, okay, so then it goes on to, to say, uh, verse, uh, verse 8, you know, he says, My child, pay attention to what your father and mother tell you. Isn't that one of the commandments? Honor your mother and father? Yeah. He says, suppose they say, come and let's find someone to kill and attack. I'm not going to go over all of it. But, uh, you know, I found that interesting when it said, let's find someone to kill, let's attack someone innocent or some innocent people for the fun of it. You know, when I thought about that, we see a lot of this, you know, because we have the internet today and we've got things like YouTube and whatnot, we've got plenty of information to show us the ugliness of the world today that we're living in. And this is true. Today we find a lot of groups of young people that will go out there and find people just to attack and to hurt and to kill. Um, but what I like, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just read uh, verse 20. I'm going to just read through it briefly because uh, I like all of it. Uh, starting at 20, it says, Listen, wisdom is calling out in the streets, marketplace. We've all heard that. Call, calling loudly at the gates and wherever people come together. Foolish people, how long do you want to be foolish? How long will you enjoy making fun of knowledge? Will you never learn? Listen when I reprimand you. I will give you good advice and share my knowledge with you. I have been calling you, inviting you to come. Uh, I'm trying to get to... Uh, because for the sake of time, I'm just going to paraphrase it. So the part I like about it is when it talks about all of this um, not listening to wisdom and doing all of these bad things, uh, I like when it says, uh, so when you get into trouble, I will laugh at you. I will make fun of you when terror strikes. This is wisdom, right? And I thought about it. I thought, you know, that's what Satan does. You know, he, he tempts people to do his will. And then when they do it and they stumble and fall, he points a finger and he laughs at you. Right? He mocks you when you do what he wants you to do. Um, okay. So, yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah, yeah.
Uh, they got you to fall into their trap. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I like that story. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, okay, uh, so let me just go through the lesson study here. Uh, experts in error. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 20. Um, I didn't read that yet, did I? No. Wait a sec. Okay, it's down here. Let me uh, just get to it. Uh, it is, but I didn't see where it says what is falsely called knowledge. Paul warns against what is falsely called knowledge. Though he is working from a different uh, text, the principle is still applicable. This is, think about all the information, all the teaching, all the beliefs, not only now but also throughout human history that were flat out wrong. People can indeed be experts in error. So, I mean, think about some of the things that were taught in the past. Think of some of the things that we've been taught in recent times. Um, you know, people always look at people that are wise and educated as having all the answers. You know, but unfortunately, at times, I mean, when we look way back in time, you know, um, when we think about how they viewed the earth, for example, um, uh, I'm going to just read a little bit more. It says, For nearly 2,000 years, the world's smartest people, the experts, believed that the Earth sat immobile in the center of the universe while all the stars and the planets orbited in perfect circles. So basically, they thought the Earth stood still and everything revolved around the Earth, right? But we know today that the Earth is what's actually revolving, right? But these were the experts. These were the smartest people of their time. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that a lot of our belief systems are based on what we're told. Some people just go by what they're told. Sometimes we read and study these things and we believe them and they could be so far from the truth, especially when, it, when we compare it to the Word of God, right? Uh, we might think that it's truth because, hey, well, you know, a professor in college taught me that it's got to be true. The book said it, right? So we have huge differences in God's word and worldly views, right? Again, the worldview versus, and that's what really this is about. It's really about science today and the arts, and we'll include philosophies in that, the teachings of men as opposed to the teaching of the word of God. Um, so it, it also goes on to say, some very complicated math and science, or excuse me, some very complicated math and science were used to buttress this belief, even though it turned out to be wrong in almost every particular, hence we could say that these people were experts in error and that the, this teaching certainly was falsely called knowledge. Uh, anybody come up with something off the top of their head briefly? Uh, something that was said to be true that we know today is not true? Yeah, there's a lot, right? Give us one, Chuck. Give us one. I had a few, I just didn't write them down. There is many. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read the bottom real quick and we'll move on to Wednesday. Biological science today, for instance, is predicated on the assumption that life began billions of years ago. And there's one, right? By chance, with no God and no purpose behind it. At the same time, an incredible amount of complicated and detailed scientific literature has been ar arisen based on this teaching. Um, what lessons can we take away from this about how people can be experts in error? How should this realization impact Christian education in general and teaching in sciences, uh, of science in particular? So yeah, you know what, what always gets me is that people will say to me when I try to witness about the Word of God, were you there? Because we can say the same thing, right? Were you there billions of years ago? No. Well, then how do you know it's true, right? Uh, what I always like to tell people, though, is what's very interesting is that we have written information that dates back 6,000 years, right? Especially if you were to go to Europe, the Middle East, you would find that people's history dates back thousands of years. And interestingly enough, their history, even outside of God's Word, does align with God's Word. For example, uh, you know, I had a, a, a Persian friend and, uh, you know, they, they know a lot about uh, Cyrus, 
uh, Cyrus the Great is what he's called to them, right? And the Cyrus I'm speaking of is the Cyrus during the time of the Babylonian exile, okay? Uh, they know he exists. They believe in him completely and utterly, you know, because it's in their history books. And they don't believe in the Bible, you know, but yet it's there. And when you compare it to what the Bible says, same information. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you one more, and I'm going to end it on that note. But um, one of the interesting things to, to go ahead and back this up also is that, uh, you know, I did a study on uh, the abomination of desolation. And when I found and read what happened during that time period, the details of it, I went to Wikipedia, and I found that the information in Wikipedia, outside of the Word of God, the history was exactly the same, exactly the same as what the Bible had said. Okay, so any comments before we go any forward, or move forward? So the, the, the point of this was, though, that even though philosophers and teachers outside of the Word of God teach these things, they could be totally wrong about what they're saying. And, and we're learning this now when we look back in history, too, right? Funny that when we're living in a time period, we think we know everything, but then as we go into the future, we look back and we go, boy, we really were dumb back then, right? And I use that word because it's true, because even God likens us to sheep, and sheep aren't the very smartest creatures, right? Go ahead, brother. Oh, oh, go ahead, brother. Sorry, hold on, Chuck. Sure. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I, I didn't catch you off, did I? Okay. Uh, yeah, and it's true. I mean, just because we say science, it doesn't mean that science is false. God is the one behind science, but we have to recognize that and not go outside that science in itself is the truth because obviously what science teaches doesn't always line up with what God teaches. Go ahead, brother. Right, right, right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, every day they're pulling up archaeological finds that bring truth to what the Bible already said. Right. Okay, um, Okay. so is there any other comment? Okay, let's go to Wednesdays. And Wednesday's heading is foolishness and wisdom. Proverbs 1, uh, I, how did I, wait a minute. Yeah, sorry, thank you. I, I was like, hold on a second, my, my page flipped on me. Okay, Thursdays. The Lord answered Job. Okay, so uh, most of us, I believe, are pretty familiar with the story of Job, right? So we're going to look at it a little bit closer here. Give me one second, and we're going to pull a few things from it and hopefully get something new out of it. Um, so uh, 
it's, the question is, what does it teach us about God, not just as the creator, but as the sustainer of all life? How should this important truth impact how we understand the arts and sciences? Um, in verse 4, God basically tells Job, were you there when I made the world? And I made that comment earlier. Well, I wasn't there a billion years ago. Were you there a billion years ago? And God is saying to Job, were you there when I made the world? And that's a good question, right? Um, some of them that I just pulled up just briefly was, who closed the gates to hold back the sea when it burst from the womb of the earth? And I believe that relates to the flood, right? Because the only time I know that water actually came out in the Bible from the earth was during the flood. Um, so he's saying, you know, who closed the gates and held back the water when the earth burst? Uh, 16 says, uh, have you been to the springs in the depths of the sea? Have you walked on the floor of the ocean? I like that one because, of course, in Job's time, nobody was going to the deepest depths of the ocean, obviously. But uh, I just want to mention one interesting thing, just briefly. Um, have you been to the springs in the depths of the sea? Has anybody ever seen, uh, when they have gone to the deepest depths of the ocean, and they actually find, believe it or not, lakes, small little lakes at the bottom of the ocean? How do you have a lake at the bottom of an ocean? Well, I can't give you all the details. Maybe you can, but um, it has to do, I believe, with the salt content in the water. And the, the water can actually divide at some point because of the salt content, and they would have like this water that's totally, you can see it, it's totally different. And these little creatures, these little snakes swim above it, and then they dive into it, and they do this weird thing where they spiral out of control for a while. They don't, scientists don't know why they do it. And then all of a sudden, they'll, co they'll come back up out of that little bit of water, and they'll be like normal again. So talk about a phenomenon, very strange. But that's what stood out to me, you know, the springs at the bottom of the ocean, uh, unless somebody else has a, another answer for that one. Um, Unfortunately, uh, you know, we often believe what we're taught, unfortunately. Um, and of course, the question always is, what is truth, as I mentioned before? Um, and, I, and for me, truth is like faith, you know. Uh, Hebrews 11 says that faith is, uh, I'm just going to jump ahead, it says it's the evidence of things not seen. So in other words, I have to have proof in order to believe something, right? And, and a non-Christian might argue, well, again, were you there? <laughs> well, no, but the Bible says this and this. If you do this, you'll get this. And so you put it to the test, and it happens, right? So we go, well, now I believe. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, thanks. Um, which brings to mind something that I wanted to share uh, in, uh, let's see, uh, was it Proverbs 1? Yeah, we're on Proverbs 1. Um, I'm going to have to skip it because it's not coming to me right now. Okay, so moving forward, we're fortunately on Thursday's lesson. So the lesson says that uh, m uh, many teach the matter possesses vital power, and I'm not going to read that. Uh, but it says also that nature is the servant of her creator. Nature testifies of an intelligence, a presence, an active energy that works in and through her laws. There is in nature the continual working of the Father and the Son, Christ says. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. That's Ellen G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, unfortunately, as stated earlier so, much of, earlier, so much of science works on the atheistic, materialistic uh, presupposition. Um, let me jump ahead to Friday because I just want to point something out. Uh, I'm just going to go to Friday, and, 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 it, and it ties in with this. Um, two reasons exist why science, which gets so many things right, gets origins so wrong. So meaning where things came from, right, or, origins. Uh, first, science, which studies the natural world, must look only to the natural world for answers. So in other words, science does not believe in things that are supernatural, does it? It only believes in things that the human mind can comprehend, that it can see, that it can touch. Anything outside of that, science doesn't believe in. Okay? Uh, second, science assumes that the laws of nature must remain constant, yet both these are wrong when it comes to origins. Oh, let's see what it goes on to explain. I'm going to read it all because it, I, I found it pretty uh, insightful. Take the first one, which requires natural causes for natural events. That's fine for hurricane tracking, but it's worse than worthless for origins that start out with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What can, si what can science, which denies the supernatural in origins, teach us about origins that were totally supernatural? And I like that, you know, because here, it's, science believes in only things that aren't supernatural, like I said, that are things that are tangible, for example, right? So, is a hurricane natural? I mean, is it something, or is it something supernatural? Okay. Okay. Yes. That's right. That's right. And in Job, we see that also, right? Um, so it's basically telling us, though, is how can science explain something that's supernatural if it doesn't believe in the supernatural? But yet that's who we rely on to give us the information about these things, leaving God out of the picture, right? Um, so the lesson also goes on to tell us, in the constancy of nature, this seems to make sense, except that Romans 5.12 tells us, Therefore, just as through one man entered sin the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, proposes a natural environment discontinuous and uh, qualitatively different from anything that science now confronts. A world in which death did not exist is radically different from anything we can study today. So, in other words... Um, uh, let me just go on and read it. It'll, it'll explain it. Um, hence, science gets origins wrong because it denies two crucial aspects of the creation, the supernatural force behind it and the radical physical discontinuity between the original creation and what's before us now. So in other words, they don't, put in science the way the world was before, only how it is now. So, yeah. So, you had a comment, Chuck? Well, I was going to say, the downside is that uh, if we are Christians, they believe we're all changed. It's predicted by him, and not predicted by Jesus basically means like went outside the law of nature. Sure. And 
true. Yeah, I would, I would think that, uh, like you, brother, uh, that when we put the two together, because you do have the knowledge of God where an atheist wouldn't have that knowledge, that you probably see something even more incredible than most people would see because of that. You find what? My thing was, was that you might have a better understanding as far as these things than maybe somebody that didn't believe in God for. Yeah. Okay. Honest answer. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, real quick, I think we could get these two comments in. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, we're, we're, we're done. I, uh, we're just going to, we're over time now. So thank you, class, for your participation.